that is hosted by the Abbasi Program uh, for Islamic Studies and the Humanities Center. Today, our speaker is Salim Tamari. Um, um, I am uh, Samir Sabir from Theater and Performance Studies, and uh, I am introducing Salim for you today. Uh, Salim is Emeritus Professor of Sociology at Birzeit University and Senior Research Associate at the Institute for Palestine Studies, which is the oldest independent nonprofit public service institute in the Arab world. He is the editor of the world-renowned The Jerusalem Quarterly. Currently, Dr. Tamari is an international visiting scholar at the Humanities Center here at Stanford University. His recent publications include Mountain Against the Sea, A Conflicted Modernity, The Storyteller of Jerusalem, The Life and Times of Wasif Jawahiriye, uh, and that book was um, uh, written with Rassam Nassar, A Year of the Locust, Erasure of the Ottoman Era in Palestine, Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Nablus, 1908, The Great War and the Remaking of Palestine, Landed Property and Public Endowments in Jerusalem, written with Munir Fakhreddin, and upcoming from UC Press, Camera Palestina, Photography and the Sensual Impulse. Dr. Tamari holds a PhD in sociology from Manchester University and has held positions as visiting professor at UC Berkeley, Georgetown University, NYU, Cornell, University of Chicago, Harvard University, and Columbia University. Dr. Tamari was awarded the State of Palestine's Prize for Life Achievements in the Social Sciences and Humanities in 2017. Today, we have the honor of hosting him for the following lecture, Surveillance, Cartography, and Repressed Memory. Please help me to welcome Dr. Dr. Tamari for this presentation. Thank you, Samer, for this generous invitation and for hosting me here at Stanford University. I'm very grateful for the Abbasi program, particularly to Richard Gladys, Blades, Farah Sharif, and Matthew Flinch for hosting me today. And of course, for the Stanford Humanity Center for having me here this spring. The talk of today, Surveillance, Cartography, and Repressed Memory, is based on a recent uh, exhibit which took place in the Patan Foundation at the beginning of uh, 2022, 20, this year, uh, which was called Palestine from Above. And it deals with the use of uh, monitoring equipment, aerial photography, surveillance techniques, and also ethnographic material uh, to examine modes of control over the Holy Land. So the section I'm dealing with uh, actually is focused on railroads, trains, and collective memories of trains during the war. This is the subject. Aerial photography and cartography won a major victory in the field for surveillance and control during the First World War. The following presentation is based on the exhibit Palestine from Above, of which I was co-curator in the Qatar Foundation in Ramallah. Viewing Palestine from the sky is historically part of a clear colonial war of subjugation and control, waged through cutting edge photography, cartography, remote sensing and surveillance, hand in hand with operations of armies on the ground. In our current time, it has evolved into a complex technology of biometric security industry, camera surveillance, and military logistic control. Reading the aerial gaze of Palestinian geography requires scrutinizing the logistics behind placing the technology up in the sky and the reasons behind the production of these images. Military technology of the 20th and 21st centuries have superseded but not replaced the hegemony of religious imagination in interpreting the struggle between good and evil 
in the eyes of believers. Uh, the material of which the aerial photography has excelled comes from the German aerial reconnaissance, which took place in collaboration with the Ottoman army, as well as another set of uh, images used by the Australian Air Force and British Air Force and French Air Force during First World War. But material we're discussing here comes from the Bavarian State Archive, which contains uh, about 1,400 highly developed images that took place between the middle of 1917 and the end of 1918 when the, the German and Ottoman forces were withdrawing from Palestine, but they still had control over the sky. The Bavarian State Archives provides us with a pivotal moment in the evolution of surveillance techniques that were crucial in the development uh, of cartography and its application in telegraph lines, railway construction, urban planning, and colonial control during the Great War over the population of the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire. In this presentation, I will examine the connection between the construction of railroads during the First World War and its evocation of corvée labor and conscription, which is called Sefer Berlik in, in Turkish. In doing so, I have examined a number of archival sources, diaries, memoirs, folk songs, as well as documentary archives and aerial photography from the Bavarian State Archives. Ethnographic accounts of the Great War is hindered by problems emanating from the rampant illiteracy from that period and by the destruction of the Ottoman records from Palestine and Syria during the sudden retreat of the army. They began to retreat on December 9th from the southern part of Palestine and finished their completion of the northern Palestine November 1918. During that period, most of administrative records, uh, as well as uh, surveillance records, were destroyed to protect uh, the, the cachet from uh, control by the uh, LMB's invading army. But only, only court records remained intact. So that's why that period suffers a great deal from the absence of local Ottoman um, uh, records. Ethnographic accounts of the Great War is hindered by problems emanating from rampant illiteracy, time mentioned. Oral narratives from the 70s and 80s, as well as personal memoirs and diaries, are an important source of alternate narratives to the official archives. German area photography provides a significant window to the landscape topography, and in this case, the monitoring of rail lines of Palestine. So the question is, can we rely on oral narratives, on diaries, on memoirs, seen by most social scientists as highly subjective and uh, not critical as an alternate base for supplementing the absence of uh, uh, archival material? And can we use, which is what I will do here, material like folk songs, ballads, and ditties, ditties are taktuk uh, for your benefit, uh, as a reliable source for the writing of social history. This is the question, it's a methodological question that I will raise here. Now, in monotheistic religions, uh, in the Holy Land, in the Middle East, the struggle between good and evil was fought always from high altitude. We have the example of uh, Moses arriving in Transjordan from 40 years of wandering and looking at Mount Nebo before the armies of Joshua entered the Holy Land. So it's all from above. We have the example of Jesus fighting the devil at the Mount of Temptation, or succeeding. We have one of the most spectacular episodes in the Bible, God orders the sun to stand still in Gibeon, in the present day village of Jabba, 
so that the Israelite army under the command of Joshua can smite the native Amorite population who resisted their entry to the Holy Land. So the sun stood there for 24 hours. There's a beautiful book by Richard, an archaeological work called When the Sun Stood Still. It's one of the most exciting narratives of archaeological work uh, of Palestine that you can read about this uh, episode. Uh, Al-Burak, which is uh, the symbol and motif of the, of the exhibit we did in Ramallah, is the female winged horse that carried the Prophet Muhammad in his heavenly journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. And you see enormous amount of variation in the portrayal of uh, this winged horse, Al-Burak. In the Quran, the Burak is a male flying beast. However, in Indian, Persian, and Ottoman representation, the flying horse is always represented as a female-headed horse. Why did Burak become a female when it moved east? I don't know. In non-Arabic sources, the fear of representation is not present. That is, in Persian, Ottoman, and Indian representation, the Prophet Muhammad is clearly portrayed in his uh, physical embodiment. And he's there riding the female-headed horse. Ottoman early cartography uh, is extremely rich compared to both uh, uh, Asian, Chinese, Indian, and European uh, cartography for the early period. We have the example of uh, Kitab al-Bahriya by Terry Racy from the 15th century, and the example of Atlas Jahannama by the great Katib Shalabi, who lived uh, in the first half of the 17th century, with extremely detailed maps of the whole Mediterranean coast, as well as the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire. And their cartography is significant because in the case of Katib Shalabi, it's ethnographic cartography. In other words, there's actual uh, topographic and human uh, social description of the regions of, of these uh, maps. Uh, I should add here that Perry Rice is also noted for his single map of America, uh, which is taken from Arab navigators that accompanied according to the legend, uh, Christopher Columbus, and it's published in Istanbul in 1513. This is just 25 years after the discovery of America. A very rare uh, piece of uh, cartography. Aerial photography, urban planning, and railroad construction by the Ottoman the German Air Force was extensively used in planning Beersheba, the newest Palestinian city in the 20th century, and linking it to the Hejazi Railroad, which linked the network of uh, movement of arms, uh, armies and, and population all the way from Anatolia to Medina. It was supposed to go down to, uh, to Mecca, but it, it was stopped by the war. And then on the side of the Western Levant, you have the same lines going to Damascus, uh, linking Damascus to Aleppo, Irbid, and then moving inside the coast to Haifa, Beirut, and southern Palestine. Uh, the work of Gustav Dahlman, theologian, ethnographer, and surveyor, allowed for systematic linkages between viewing Palestine from above and examining the relevance of German topographic topographic service from a biblical perspective. His magnum opus was Arbeit und Sitte in Palestina, as well as his uh, magnificent 100 aerial photographs of Palestine, which was published in Leiden in 1925. Another piece of uh, ethnographic mapping comes from a Nablus historian, who was an adjunct in the Ottoman army by the name of uh, Rafiq Tamim. Uh, he published a book, which was a manual for the military officers in the army, 
called the Philistine Recidency, or the uh, Philistine Recidency in Arabic, in English, it would be the Treaties on Palestine. The military manual of Ottoman Army published in 1915 by Rafiq Tamimi will note the manner in which ethnicity was introduced as a way of assessing the population in terms of degrees of sedentarization, hostility, and friendliness. This is a magnificent map. Uh, if you look closely at it, uh, can I move or do we need the. You can see that in Ottoman cartography, they used uh, both ethnicity and religious identity as a way of examining how the population was dispersed. One of the most interesting features of this distinction is that they did not distinguish the people by ethnicities that we are familiar with today. For example, the Arab East was not distinguished between Turks and Arabs, but between Syrians and Arabs. Arabs were in the vertical lines, and they are the so-called uh, unsedentarized population, meaning tribal population, going all the way from Sun to Istanbul to, uh, to Mosul, these would be Arabs. On the Western side, we have Syrians. Syrians are urbanized and village people who from the point of view of um, uh, Ottoman strategy are people who can be domesticated. They are more liable for urbanization, for planning, and and presumably domestication. You also have pockets of religio-ethnic communities. They're not always ethnic, and the religious communities are mixed. So you have Maronites, and Jews, Jews, and this is Arabs, Syrians, Jews, Turkmen's. So for the Turkish population, also the same distinction is used. You have Turkmen's from uh, Sivas all the way to the east, and you have Turks from uh, the western part of Anatolia and the Rumli part of, uh, of Europe, which was Turkish. So these were Turks, the others were Turkmen. So the Turks constituted a, a very small, not a very small, but a, 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 a sizably small part of the Turkish population. Great War was a major vehicle in accelerating the process of modernity, building of railroad, railroads, electrification, and telegraphs were seen as essential cornerstones of Ottoman modernity in Anatolia and the Arab provinces. During the First War, the building of railroads was speeded up to link Anatolia with the southern flanks of the empire. So this is a scheme of the Hejazi Railroad, which was an imperial scheme moving population and, and guns was uh, expedited, facilitated by expediencies of war. And you can see how extensive it has become in the Ottoman Arab provinces linking Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon to the Hejaz. The war created a new sense of mobility which ended the physical and psychological isolation of regional centers. The new network of railroads linking Jerusalem to Jaffa and to the front allowed a massive number of people to link with the world around them. It also created a new national consciousness that has been so far dormant and implicit in people's historical memory. The building of railroads here are connected to two feature, devastating feature of war, which I'm going to discuss in the case of the lost trade that I'm about to speak about, namely corvée labor and suffer uh, Corvée labor was used under the rubric of volunteer labor by which minorities and older people and sometimes suspect population were mobilized to dig trenches for the army and to build a, a fast issues of infrastructure. And these were known as Tawabir al Amani, or the work brigades. It was backbreaking work that uh, created a curse in the collective memory of people about the war. Um, Sabar Barnik, of course, is more uh, 
recognized as the process of conscription by which hundreds of thousands of young men were mobilized and sent to fight in Erzurum, in Yemen, in southern Palestine, and of course in Gallipoli, in the, in the, in the Anatolian states, uh, the four corners of the war. Many of these young men never returned. So Safar Berlik is impounded in the consciousness of not only Arabs, but Jews, uh, Turks, Anatolians, and especially Armenians as a process from which the young people never came. Almost one sixth of the population of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, especially in the Arab East, mostly young conscripts died during the four years of the war. The highest percentage of death in the world during this great war. In other words, it's higher than Germany, Britain, France, Belgium, and all the European countries in proportion to the population. Between one fifth and one sixth of the population perished. Now, out of this havoc, I have a small minor project called the Lost Geary Jerusalem Trail. At the end of the Great War, a military train was constructed by the British Army using paid and corvée labor to connect Jerusalem with the Northern Front. The train carried troops and military equipment. No traces of this train exist today, except in folk songs and sparse archival documents. In fact, there is an issue whether it exists or not. And I have been challenged many times to prove that it existed. And I must say that I haven't succeeded completely so far. The discussion of popular memories of aerial reconnaissance, aerial bombardment as experienced from below. The abandoned beer in Jerusalem train is an example of how folk songs preserve the lost experiences of war. So, here we have a number of folk songs that I have been examining, including popular songs that uh, have preserved in memory themes of work, of labor, of ceremonial weddings, uh, of ceremonial seasons like Muhammad, uh, but also of movement, like uh, movement by train and ships. One of the most interesting of those uh, ditties or songs is a song by Wasser Johari that uh, Sander referred to called Karshat. And what is Karshat in English? Uh, I can't translate Karshat. <laughs> yes, Scots call it haggis, which um, is a kind of tripe food that people usually consume in the big feasts. So this song, Karshat, was composed in Jerusalem by Wasif Jahari in 1916 during the Great Famine following the locust attacks in World War I. Remember, 1915, 1916 were the years of the Great Famine, not only because of locusts, but because of the bad harvests and because of the siege imposed by the British fleet on the uh, eastern coast of Syria, western coast of Syria. Eastern coast of the Mediterranean. In this song, the composer singer recalls all the famous Jerusalem dishes that disappeared due to famine and war conditions. Shahariya claims, with some exaggeration, that this satirical song became the national anthem of Palestine. And if we have time, I can play a little bit of it. Shall I do that? Actually, this. Uh, Song was saved from the archives of Beirut Radio, where it was broadcast in 1951. And we have a magnetic tape that we clean. It's not very clean, but it gives you an idea of what. Today, nobody knows this song. And there's only one person, the, grand, the great granddaughter of Wasif, who knows how to sing it. I tried to have her. Um, Recorded, but she refused. So this is his, his own sound. What happened? Hmm. <laughs> it somehow did not move to 
What shall I do? Well, it worked. It worked before. Sorry. Well, you were saved from having to hear this song. <laughs> So the Arabic version of this taktuka, as it's called, is Karshat Mahshiyya Bidat Mashwiyya Samak Matni Wal Arab Jambi Badr Wishrab Wasku Bushrab Mwani Wudrab Wa'alam Nas Wa'alam Nas Sukur Jarrab Ma'ala Al Insan Al Mahra. So you get an idea how degenerate the song is. It gets even worse as you go along, but it, it's basically uh, trying to recall the lost food which people uh, experience as a result of the war. Second song is this wedding song called Lejla's Dance. And during traditional wedding celebrations in Biru, the town where it was sung in neighboring villages, it is still possible to hear the strange incantation celebrating the roaring whistle of the Jerusalem trail, approaching the southern approaches of Kufr Aqab. And the song is, here it is in Arabic, which is the name of the song. The, the babor of Biri has, has a right, Allah jire, so it says, come Najla, do the dance of the oil jug on your head. This is my bad translation. We hear the sirens of the beer train, may God protect it. We hear its siren from the bottom of the valley. Blow your horn while still in our lands. Hold your siren with, while we bid our folks farewell. Bid our folks farewell is very significant for the song. Although it's a very wedding, it's a wedding song, it's a very sad song because it recalls the, the lost youth who would have been with them in that event. Most old timers have no recollection of a train passing by beer. This is my dilemma. Or it's in virus. Many insist that the babor, babor is Arabic for a pressure cooker. Uh, it is the same word for steamship or for a train. Comes from the Italian vapore. Vapor, vapore, babor, because babor. Uh, many insist that the babor referred to is neither a train nor a ship. Ship sirens were too far from Jaffa seashore to be audible. Some suggest that the reference must be the flour mill in Kalandia, whose grinding sounds echoes to Kufr Aqab just south of here. There are many versions of this strange song, but they all raise important issues of interpretation. Despite their recurrence in contemporary weddings and folk songs, their performers deny or at least do not recognize their association with any trains. At the core of the song themes are departure of loved ones and not seeing them again. This evokes two kinds of departures. Departure of dear young men to the Americas, who rarely come back, at least in that period. Now with the uh, sharper jet planes, I think this has changed. And it recalls Sefer Berlin, the conscription. Departure of young men during the war who almost never came back. The denial of these origins of the Biri Babur <coughs> The, the denial of these origins of the Bira Babur is related, in my view, to the repression of memories of lost young men in war. It is also related to the non-returning men in immigration and their association with the departure of the train and the ship. But why is the existence of the train itself denied? I will answer this question in a minute. So here I look for archival evidence in five, five minutes. Uh, I look for archival evidence for this trade. <clears throat> and significantly, the first archival ev evidence is a photograph from the albums of Wasif Johari, who wrote an ethnography of war, of, of uh, daily life in Palestine during the war. 
showing the movement of a train taken by Lewis Larson from the American colony and showing some Australian soldiers underneath it with the train on top of the tombs of the kings. If you know Jerusalem, you know this is uh, the Tomb de Roi, Tombs of the Kings, near Sheikh Jarrah, heading north. He called it Tarazina al-Jaysh al in Al-Quds. I don't know what Tarazina is, but perhaps people in the audience can help me. The date is 1918. The second evidence is more important, I think, because it shows the same train taken by an aerial photograph taken on August 15, 1918, by the German Air Force and preserved today in the Bavaria State Archives. It is the only photographic evidence of the disappeared train in action. And uh, Train is right here. This is a railroad. This is Shafat, and it's moving north of Jerusalem, which is here. And this is the single evidence of the train, and you can see a bit of its uh, fog, not fog. It's fog. So this is the asphalted road from Jerusalem to Nablus, and this is the train lines. I have another picture where the Banua section of here, you see here, in which the train is moving. A lot of the days in which the German Air Force were taking photographs during that period were very foggy because it was winter when they started. So we were lucky to have a very clear picture of that day exactly when the train was moving. Uh, the aerial photographs containing images of the Beery Jerusalem line contain several contours which can constitute valleys transgressing the central highlands. The most important of which is the notorious Valley of the Thieves near Sinwat, which is known as Riyul Harami, Spring of the Thieves, so called because it was a major site for highway robberies during the Nablus Jerusalem, uh, along the Nablus Jerusalem road. The actual reference to the whistle, siren, and the bridges in the song may simply be dictated by the rhyme of the wedding song, and not by association to the sounds of the train produced. Finally, we have a report by uh, Cotterell about the history of the railway in Palestine, which describes how General Alambi began to build a railroad using Egyptian and uh, Palestinian male and female labor to construct a military train that takes it from Jerusalem to the front of the north while the Ottoman army was, was, uh, 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 was retreating. According to the historian Pick, the new rail system was built by Colonel Jordan Bell, who commanded Rail Builders Company 272 of the British Engineering Corps, some 850 laborers, Egyptians, Egyptians because the British brought the Egyptian labor force with them uh, to Palestine uh, after Alambi's victory. And local Arabs worked on it. Half of them were women. So finally, I asked the question, did the Bira train exist? In my view, the main reason for the disappearance of the train from local memory, and I should add from national Palestinian memory, has to do with its usage. Unlike the Hijazi Railroad and the Haifa Jaffa Jerusalem line, which was heavily used as means of transport, the Bira train was a military installation used for the transport of armaments and soldiers to the new front. As far as we know, it is neither a means of public transport nor did it serve any civilian economic needs. It was also short-lived and disappeared as soon as the front moved northwards and the fighting reached a dramatic end with the fall of Damascus and Aleppo. Only the sound of the train is recalled and its evocation of war memories. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... I uh, will have the honor of moderating uh, quick questions.
question in a sort of period. Um, so um, first, uh, uh, I'll start with a couple of questions uh, that we have already um, on the web. Um, uh, the easiest of, is of the last bit, which is if the picture of the, that we saw, uh, the aerial photograph, is not of a train, what could it be of? If, if this if the the railroad that is present is questionable and potentially there's there was no train, then what could that picture be about? I don't know. I mean, it's uh, uh, to me, it's it's very hard to say that it's this is, this is the second part of the image going through a silhouette. There's no train here. There's a railroad. And there is a little lake which still exists near Birkhod Barur, and there is a bridge which is called Jisr al Nos, which is referred to as the sun. In the actual picture, uh, I mean, this is definitely a railroad which has been dismantled since then, and the black object can be a carriage, can be a carriage that. Yeah. I would like to think it's a train because it's in the song. <laughs> <laughs> what, but, yeah, even if it's a carriage, it's a carriage on a rail. Yeah, it's a carriage on a rail. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you could say the German doctor. But th these were images, by the way, taken for bombardment. The, the area is already under British control, and the Germans, because they did not have effective anti aircraft, uh, they could not shoot, they could not effectively shoot the German air uh, aircraft. So these were made for taking images in order to prepare themselves for uh, traffic of a bomb. The train would have been a, an object of the bomb. Uh, another question that came up is um, why are trains important to Palestinian history and culture? If, if they show up in songs, if they have a presence, like a jazz train is very much a kind of a, has a presence and mention uh, in Palestinian culture. Um, what what is the significance of these trains, and why are they important historically and culturally? Well, my suggestion is that for that period, they're significant because they move people outside their crucible to the outside world. But mainly during the war, because they took away young men, never to be returned. And later, they were sources of migration. Babur is also a ship. Babur is a train and a ship. Steamship is a Babur. In fact, more likely Babur is, a, in this particular case, it's first a train. But more likely Babur, they say he took the Babur from uh, Alexandria to Marseille. So it's a very common line, or from Jaffa to, uh, to, to the United States via Marseille, or via Genoa. So it was the source of migration, going to the new world, going away, leaving the family alone, mostly leaving the females and children alone, going as a male. So the trains have this association of uh, rupture, of departure, and of war. Uh, one question I have here is, what is the distinction between the Syrians and Arabs in their field of the Mimi map? Because you showed us in the map there were there, the, the key that was showing us, I guess, uh, you can show us that map again. Yeah, right there, that map. Yeah. You've got Suri, right? Yeah. There, you've got the Suri and you've got the Arabi. Yeah. Uh, so the Arab and, and Syrians, what, why, what, uh, what is the distinction between them ethnically? Well, ethnically there is no distinction. There is a social distinction. Syrians were urban and rural peasants, and uh, sedentarized urban population were Syrians. So coastal Palestine, highlands, coastal Syria and Lebanon, were all Syrians. 
Donc, il nous pose quatre créanciers. Uh, inlands were Arabs, meaning that tribal people who the Ottoman administration had trouble infusing them with Ottoman citizenship and with domesticity. So it's really the distinction between a tribal population and a non tribal population. But they were all Arabs. But the word Arabs was not used. They used it for the Hijazis, by the way. And they used it for tribal groups in Syria and Iraq. But in uh, lateral Syria, these were Syrians and not Arabs. And uh, it's an interesting use because the Egyptians also used the word shwam to mean the sedentarized Syrians. They would not call the Iraqis or the people from the periphery of the Syrian desert shwam. Shwam are people from Damascus or Aleppo or Jaffa, or Jerusalem, these are the Shwans. It's, it's equivalent to the Ottoman term, Syria. Uh, what about this train from Elbire to Jerusalem? Why, why, would, why would that exist? Is there a connection, historical connection, between the Ramallah Bire area and Jerusalem that would mandate the creation of that railroad? Uh, you mean why is it Bir and not Ramallah? Why is it Bir and not Ramallah? Why is it uh, oh. not somewhere else? Well, the, the railroad was built on roads that were already asphalted or, or adjacent to them. So the, the actual contours had prepared themselves for the laying of railroads. The Ramallah side of it is very mountainous, so it makes it very difficult for the train to move. But the purpose of the train, as I tried to mention, maybe I wasn't clear, is to move troops to the northern front. See, the Ottomans were retreating with the Germans, and the train was to bring heavy equipment and, and troops to the northern front. And were the areas more population, was there more population along the railroad in the first place? To facilitate this was a highly populated uh, line, yeah. I mean, all the suburbs of Jerusalem, which today are completely linked. But it becomes very wild as you pass near it, it becomes a place which is called Wadi al mm -hmm. There's a film about it, Eyes of the Thieves. It's a misnamed film by the director thought the eyes, Yun is eyes, the Yun means springs. So that's a very rock. Rough area and not populated at all. That's why uh, Highway Roberts took place there. That's, uh, that's the film by, by Nelson and God, by the way, uh, The Eyes of the Thief. Um, uh, Lisa, please. Yes, uh, the, I would say the common theme in which the others saw the natives in these songs is the question of loss. Uh, I mean, in, 
in the Turkish Sefer Berlik songs, the idea of going to Yemen is very big. And the loss of young people in Yemen. This is very common in the themes, loss of children who go to war. And you ask me how they see the, the others see them. Uh, in these songs, I, I, I have to think about what you use, but I think the issue of uh, peasant and uh, urbanite is very big. Uh, the, the way, because a lot of these songs uh, uh, have to do with the cycle of uh, agricultural production. So the seasons and the seasonal ceremony. There are two kinds of season and ceremony, which is very important, these songs. One is uh, weddings and birth and death, because there are tahalil of death also. Uh, or the seasons of the saints, saints' shrines. For example, the songs pertaining to Nabi Musa, Moses, are very distinct. The songs pertaining to Nabi Rubin, which is the most important season in the coast, which is the biblical Reuven, the songs of St. George, which is called Khadr, and songs attributed to the Virgin Mary. And these are songs sung by all people, not only Christians and Jews, not only Christians and Muslims, but uh, they are common to them. Uh, the most important seasonal songs are related to uh, Moses. Interesting that Moses is a Muslim prophet, not a Jewish one in this, in this celebration, because Moses in the Jewish tradition died in, uh, in Transjordan, Mount Nebo. So these seasonal songs have a lot to do with uh, uh, chivalry, with uh, recalling the religious attributes of uh, Prophet Reuben or St. George, or sometimes the Virgin Mary, and in this case, uh, Moses. And it has a lot to do with sense of pride. And the pride comes from where they come from. So each village, each location in Hebron, in Nablus, in the Jerusalem mountains have their particularistic uh, versions of these songs that are marker of identity. And all of them make a distinction between us uh, peasants and them the urban folks.